Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem maximum profit in job scheduling. We're given n jobs. Each job has a start time and an end time as well as a profit associated with it. The problem is that some of these jobs might overlap each other, but we want to find the list of jobs that don't overlap at all and that maximize the total profit. So in this case, it's these two jobs. Add the profits together, we get 120. Now there was one other way that we could have jobs that are not overlapping. Well, I think there's a few, but this is one as well. But we can see the profit with these two is gonna be 90. That's not as big as 120, so we choose these jobs. Now, conceptually, not super difficult to understand, but the first thing that I personally notice, and I would encourage you to kind of think about it in this way as well, I started thinking about just scanning left to right. Immediately, I want to know, should we be going for some type of brute force decision tree type solution that might be backtracking or maybe we'll be able to optimize it with some memoization? That's always kind of option one, but sometimes there's a better solution than this, and that's option two, and that's usually a greedy type solution. Like maybe we can solve this problem in just a single pass without having to consider different decisions. Now, pretty much immediately, I kind of knew that this was not going to be possible. I didn't know for sure, but intuitively, this is how I thought about it. Okay, suppose we chose this as the first job. Then we might have choices. In this case, we have choices. We can either choose this job with a profit of 40 or this job with a profit of 70. Probably the most obvious greedy solution would be to always choose the job that has a higher profit. But in that case, we're not considering the end time of each job. And also, we can't really make the best decision here unless we know for sure every single job that comes after because maybe there's just a couple jobs here that don't really do anything they give you one and one but there's a big job here that gives you like a hundred so it's really hard to make that decision without being able to like see the future so that's kind of how in my mind i ruled out the greedy solution so then going back to this brute force memoization decision tree type idea the thing you want to know is what could be the sub problem with this type of solution. And it's not super crazy in this problem because the original problem itself is what is the maximum profit we could get if we are allowed to consider all of the jobs. And we know that for every job, we will have up to two choices. Either we include that job or we don't include that job. So if we have that choice, suppose maybe we did include this job or maybe we didn't, but then we get to the next spot. And now the sub problem from here is no longer what's the max profit among all of the jobs. At this point, the sub problem has become what's the max profit starting from this index and maybe these are the remaining jobs that we have. So that's the sub problem. And eventually like the base case would be we just have a single job, like the last job in this list. That's the sub problem. We either include it or we don't. And I guess the real base case would be when we have zero jobs remaining. And in that case, what's the max profit of that? Probably just zero, right? Okay, so now we kind of have some intuition of how to solve this problem. We kind of know how to organize what the sub problem is. So now to be a bit more concrete, usually with these types of problems, we do have at least one parameter which tells us like the current index that we're at. Now we're given a bunch of jobs, but they're given in separate arrays and there's no guarantee about the order that they're given in. But you can probably tell intuitively by looking at this picture, we probably want the jobs to be sorted. Sorted by what? Probably not the profit, probably the start time of each job. Because then as we are iterating, like we started at this job, we either chose it or we didn't choose it. Then we increment our index I. Now I is I plus one. Now we're at the next job over here in sorted order based on the start time. Well, we kind of know immediately that this job overlaps with the previous one. So if we chose that previous job, we can't choose this one. But if we didn't choose that one, then we can choose this. So that's why we want to sort the input based on start time. With what I was kind of saying right now, 
I is obviously one parameter we want to keep track of. Should we also keep track of the previous end time? Like if I chose this job, then I should know the end time because when I go to the next job, I want to know if it overlaps with the previous job. Technically, you could do it this way. This is a valid way to do it. But then you end up getting two parameters in your recursive function. I'm going to call it DFS. You could call it whatever you want. You could call it backtracking. But basically, we're going to have like a big decision tree where we include something or don't include it. And now we realized we have a solution with two parameters. Generally, you want to minimize the parameters if it's ever possible, because when we add a caching to this, which is also called memoization, this can become the bottleneck. More parameters makes the caching less efficient. So can we actually get rid of this parameter? Yes, we can, because we can do something a little bit clever. Instead of keeping track of the end time of the previous interval that we actually chose, why not, if they're already in sorted order, if we decide to choose an interval, uh, let's consider the more simple case. If we chose to not include an interval, we're at index i, this interval, we choose not to include it. Then we can just go to i plus one. It doesn't matter what the previous end was because we didn't even choose that interval anyway. So we just go to i plus one. Now, in the case that we did choose the previous interval, where do we go? We can't necessarily go to i plus one because if we're not keeping track of this, then the next interval could overlap with the previous one. So what we do is we start here, I, and we just keep incrementing through the list until we find the first interval that does not overlap with the previous one. And once we get there, let's call that index J. We're going to use that index. And after like here, we're going to do the while loop and then we'd pass J in as a parameter. So this way, we only need one parameter in our recursive DFS function. And logically, of course, if these are sub problems, we can continue this decision tree, get more and more sub problems at every decision here. We want to know which path maximized the profit. So among these two, we would calculate which one is the maximum and then ultimately return that. So right now we have a solution which just has a single parameter, but within the function itself, we are going to need a while loop, which might iterate over all of the intervals. So currently the overall time complexity is big O of N times N that's N squared. The memory is going to be the same if we use caching. Now I'm going to code the solution up, but then I'm going to show you a relatively easy optimization we can make that actually can get the solution down to log n. I'll give you a quick hint. It has to do with the fact that we are already sorting the intervals, so we can use that to our advantage. We don't maybe need to loop through every single one of them. But let's get into the code now. Okay, so I'm definitely going to take advantage of Python in this problem. I'm going to create the intervals and if we were to just take the start time array and sort it, then we would kind of lose the mapping of start time to end time because right now they are in like the same relative order. The first start time corresponds with the first end time here. So we can group these two together into the same array, an array of tuples or pairs. And while we're at it, we should also probably include the profit because we don't want to lose the mapping of like an interval to the profit of it. So in Python, that's very easy to do. We can actually just call zip and pass in the start time array and the end time array and lastly the profit array. So this will combine these three arrays into an array of tuples where each element from each array is going to be part of the tuple. And then we want to sort this. So I'm going to do that and the fact that we put start time first is important because they will be sorted based on the start time that will have the most precedence. Now we got the intervals. Now let's move on to the DFS and we'll add caching at the end like I usually do. We just have a single parameter, i, the current interval that we're at. The main base case is going to be when we run out of intervals. So if i is equal to the length of intervals, then we can't really get any profit from no intervals remaining. So let's return zero. There's a couple cases, like I said, either we don't include the element at index i or we do include it. Let's start with don't include because it's a bit more simple. That's going to be where we just go to the next interval and we just calculate how much profit we'd get starting from there, not including the current one. With including, it's going to be a bit more complicated. 
This is where we go DFS to index J, which we haven't computed yet, but we will do that in just a second. And to this, we're also going to add, if we are including the current interval at index I, let's add the profit of it as well. So intervals at index I, and the third value in the tuple is the profit. So we say index two and add that to the result of this. From this, we want to maximize the result. So we would do something like this result equal max of this and that. And then we would return the result. Now, I still haven't shown you how to get J. It's not too bad. It's just going to be a while loop. So let's go ahead and do that while uh, first let's initialize J. Let's initialize it to I plus one. We're looking at the next interval and we're going to keep going until we find the interval that has a start time, which is greater than or equal to the current intervals end time. So let's do that while J is, let's say, less than the length of intervals. And if we get to a point such that the current intervals at index I, its end time, which is at index one, is less than or equal to the interval at J and the start time of that, which is at index zero. So let's put zero here. If we ever get to this point, let's break out of the loop. Otherwise, let's increment our J pointer. What will happen by the end of this loop, either J will be at the next interval, the next valid interval, or J will be out of bounds, in which case this if statement would execute. I also realized that we had this indented, so let me fix that. Sorry about that. Let's actually call the DFS. So out here, let's uh, return DFS starting at index zero. I'm going to add caching to this, but I will tell you that this is the n squared solution. This actually is time limit exceeded, but I'll quickly show you how to optimize it. So let's create the cache. First of all, I usually just use a hash map. Let's check here in a second base case. Is I in the cache? Have we already solved this sub problem? If we have, let's return the result that we ended up caching. If we haven't, let's compute the result down here and throw it in the cache before we return. So we can do that in this line down here. So I ran the code, but you can see, I think on the last test case, it gets time limit exceeded. So let's fix that. We see that we are running a loop inside of the recursive function. That's where the n squared comes from, because this function will only be called n unique times where this entire thing actually executes. All the other times we're going to return the cached solution. But those n times are going to require a loop, and that's going to make this n squared. Can we make it more efficient? We are looking for the first interval that has a start time that's greater than the end time of this interval. So why should we loop from left to right when we can kind of just run a binary search on the remaining intervals looking for the start time, the first start time that is greater than or equal to this one? Well, we could write our own binary search for that, but there's actually a built in method, at least in Python, that can do that for us. And it is called bisect. It's actually part of the bisect uh, module. So bisect dot bisect. And there's a few parameters we pass in. Of course, the array itself that we want to run binary search on. And before we even finish this, I want to say it's pretty easy to run bisect on a one dimensional array, but we have an array of tuples. So we can still do that. You just have to get a little bit clever and I'll show you how we can do that. What is the value that we're looking for? Well, I can't just pass in a single value like we are looking for the end time of the current interval, which we know the current interval at index I and the end time is at index one. We can't just pass this in because this is just an integer, but we have an array of tuples. So let's put this in the same format as this. We are looking for this. The start time is going to be greater than or equal to this. And for the rest of these, I just put a negative one because then if there is a tie anywhere, this one will go first. But ultimately, all this is is just a binary search. Depending on how you have your intervals formatted, you might be able to not like pass in a tuple. And you also might just be able to implement your own binary search in like a helper function if you'd like to. But this will get us the first index J that we are looking for. So now let's run this to make sure that it works. And I think this time we will actually not get time limit exceeded. And on the left, you can see the code works and it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.